Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are going to make another uh, Just24 uh, training, just a training. And today we have a very interesting topic. We have the topic of the end game strategy and how you can, um, uh, yeah, how you can master it. Because um, when I was young, um, I was always very much wondering how it's possible that with such a limited of pieces the game is still very tense, you can still have many tactics and of course there are many ways to escape. Um, I think that one of the most interesting end games I always were playing for Stillmate. Uh, I managed to play once in youth championships, I managed to get away with a draw. Even when I made my first Grandmaster Norm, I managed to uh, uh, let myself be still mated by Grandmaster with 2560. So, end games are very tricky, very complicated. You need to need all your skills to be able to, um, yeah, to master the end game. Uh, we need to have overview, general principles. You need to have concrete analysis, and. Um, we are going to see this afternoon uh, how we can master it. Um, I gave you some tournament, as you already noticed, some of you play very nice games and we will look to one of your, uh, of course, to your examples and how you manage to do it by yourself. And in this way we try to, um, yeah, to, to master simply uh, the way how we should cope with the, uh, dividing the task between the king, uh, the pieces and the pawns because we need all forces because we have only a limited uh, amount of uh, forces, um, how we can play them together. So that's, um, yeah, that's what we're going to do. Um, Please, if there's any suggestions or if you have any questions, use the chat box to ask your questions. Also, if you still have general questions about your trainings in the, over the past weeks, um, please be feel free to, to, to write it down. If you have any suggestions for the tournaments, we of course would be glad and happy to hear your suggestions too. I already um, heard that one um, player was announcing maybe some rook end games. We take everything in consideration, we will try to make as many tournaments uh, to your liking, so feel free to, again to um, to give this, uh, yeah, to write it down in the chat box and we will get back to you. So let's start uh, with one of the model games which I gave you was the game between Kasparov and Mr. Fukic. Um, it was an important um, game um, which shows uh, how to play the color composition, which is actually quite famous. Um, White has a little bit uh, better position because he has the bishop and rook, which are coordinated well. And please also pay attention to the fact that we have this pawn, uh, minor pawn on, um, on c4, which cope very well with the bishop on uh, uh, c3. Uh, so that's, um, so we have the pawn. Uh, wait, and uh, knight. So they they, they work uh, pretty good together because it's um, um, you you cover the white squares and you cover the black squares. Uh, another good thing is that you can see is that the bishop is um, attacking the knight, so that um, you always um, white is always able to take the knight out of the game and reverse is not possible. So you see that actually white is in control of which pieces should be exchanged and which not. Um, another good point is that white has a little bit more space. Um, kings are both rather safely, but the main big difference are, is the difference between the bishop and the knight. So we, what, what I want you to show, uh, what's written also in the text, which you also can see later, is when we go to end game strategy, it's always about um, uh, how to improve uh, our king, our pieces and pawns in coordination together. Uh, so we need to de de divide the task uh, between defense and attack. Uh, the king usually takes a small area where it covers several squares or pawns. Uh, pieces, of course, normally are the hunters of our forces. Uh, they try to catch pieces, try to catch attacking object like a king, or cover important squares to make progress in the position. 
um, and of course the pawns they want to promote in the end uh, but before it can be done very often we can gain some space on the left and the right side to limit uh, our opponent's resources uh, so it will be much more easy to make progress with our own pieces and of course at some point we make tension we attack pawns with our own pawns to get a breakthrough and win the game uh, that was actually also one of the questions which was made by Mr. Pramot thank you very much again for your questions uh, I think that mainly all, uh, when you want to um, win games and you have a very good position try to improve your position to the maximum and of course at some point there should become some tactics left or on the right side um, and that's what we're going to see so let's go on so bishop c3 queen b6 the first moves i will do a little bit uh, rather uh, fast because i want to point out um what's the main uh what's the main course of today our main point uh, learning point is that we want to see how uh, all these moves can be done uh together um, so g4 uh, we, we protect our pawns on the uh, king side uh, so we limit the knight even further uh, and with f3 we actually close the whole king side the pawns protect each other which means that our pieces are free to um, to attack um, and uh, in this way um, um, it, yeah, it should be good to, um, uh, to to take the knight out of the game to get our queen active and um, so black played a6, small move and now comes another important move, a4. We will see later on that this is a very important move because we try to restrict the, the pawns on the queen side which means that uh, our c pawn which is actually the pawn which um, gives us advantage because it's, uh, it can be a pass pawn and by playing a4, a5 um, b7 will be attacking object and also it will be much easier to make further progress with b4 so these moves on the side are very important to limit uh, yeah, black resources on both sides so that in the end um, it's much easier to calculate how you will do it so, Queen d3 trying to exchange queens uh, doesn't release any um, uh, any uh, tension um, on the position because after taking which was probably one of black's idea that could be fine because after taking back we can play rook f1 and now you see that that was actually probably black's intention we can play rook e3 with the idea rook e2 and the rook will get active. Um, that's something important. So that's that's of course something very nice. But white uh, was seeing uh, this, and he played uh, king to c1. Um, king c7, and of course now that makes a huge difference because after taking a rook of one, there there's no longer rook e3 because we can simply play king b2 and there's nothing uh, to play for, but the rook is even trapped. So king c6, king c2, rook d7. Again we see a very standard position. Um, um, white improved his king. Uh, the rook is not yet improved, but of course uh, we, don't, we are not in a hurry, like what Wenig said. Um, one of the main points in end games is that you always should consider it as like you're on a holiday. Um, we have a pleasant time, there's a smooth wind, there's some sunshine, um, and you just like to enjoy your position very much, because uh, very often I notice that even, you're, even though you're better, um, uh, you still feel some kind of tension. I should win this position, I'm much better, or something like this. But very important that in chess, especially when you're better, you're on the better side. So it's very strange in that case to be stressful because actually you should be the one who can enjoy his position very much. Um, because, yeah, when you're defending, it's of course not always that pleasant to look to your position. But when you're better, of course, you only think about positive. Uh, opportunities. 
So once more, keep relaxed, um, enjoy your position, enjoy your possibilities and think every time how can I improve my king, how can I improve my pieces or should I improve my pawns first. So we always think from those three uh, points. And one of the other things which we should keep in mind is that we have the dominant factor. Is um, you have the, the factor in which you can win the position. Um, so first we don't think about how we will win, but we first we will improve the position a little bit more. We play a5. a5 is a very pleasant move. Why? Because b7 will stay on its place. Um, we can, once more, we can improve the position with b4 and maybe in the end we can play b5 or maybe I don't know, there's actually there are many options. Uh, you can first play your king to b3, but every time everything comes with time. Uh, for example, if you would play b4, which actually looks a little bit similar, uh, that's, uh, that's not that good because now of course we can't play b5, because in that case we will make an exchange and go immediately for the end pawn and game because the pawn and game is very good if you take out the rook king we take in between and if you take out here we can just continue um, actually this is a draw so it's still fine yeah sorry this is, a, this is still fine uh, so this could have been played, but b5 is a little bit strange because there's many ways to improve. I guess after taking, uh, it's still interesting why this is happening. Because if we take here, we can take on c4. Ah, wait, I forgot. We have this important move f4. And uh, this is one of the points what I was announcing before. Uh, we have the, the we have g5 as a breakthrough, and we have the uh, the b pawn already. Uh, so in that case, black can't stop. Black can take this pawn, but then we play g5, and now he has a problem to stop our h pawn. So b5 isn't a good move, but we have a5 again. You see that he will try to destroy our pawn structure. And in this case, um, yeah, it's a problem because if we take, then uh, black can play king c5. And still black gets counterplay, and that's not our idea. Our idea is to have a relaxing time. And um, so, I will just, uh, to have a relaxing time, uh, to, to limit uh, black options and from there I'll see what we are going to do. And exactly uh, like Mr. Albert is announcing that um, we have uh, the famous game between Fischer and Tarmanov, actually in that case it was a white square bishop who was attacking f7, in this case the bishop on c3 is attacking a black square, but you're very right, very good uh, command. Uh, the famous game between Fischer and Taimanov in Vancouver was a good example of also that uh, the rook and the bishop are much better uh, working together than the knight and the rook. Um, 98. 98 is actually a little bit tricky move and you might have some small thought about it. Um, because in th this case um, black can play f6 and e5. So again, once more, when you're in this in the seat where you're much better, uh, always pay attention to your opponent's resources and how you can do it. Um, because before you know, and you play one easy move, uh, then he might get some, at least some kind of defense. Um, in this case, after rook e1, we can play rook e7. And with the idea to play e5, maybe knight c7, knight e6, and yeah, it's it's uh, in this case black is simply um, yeah black, black can get some kind of defense. 
Um, so, very smart, Kasparov played rookie one, of course, saw the idea of his opponent and stops the plan of playing e5. Rook d6, f4. Of course, this is a very tricky move because in general we, we don't want to move our pawns on the king's side because uh, g4 is weak, needs support. Um, and normally you, you don't want to do it because your uh, pieces should uh, will get um, more defensive task. But in this position it's okay um, because we have already the threat of bishop takes f6 and g5 and also g5 immediately. So it's a way to make progress and get your pawns to the other side. We see we can't improve the king. So again, when we look back to the questions, there's no improvement uh, at the moment possible. We can't improve our pieces. So in that case, our pawns should be improved. So that's also one of the important things is when you look to positions, always ask yourself the question, which one do you, do you want to improve first? And continue in that way. Knight of six. Now, the position comes to the climax. Um, very important is that you can have such a general force, which I was just um, telling uh, for a very long time, but every game will be won by one simple uh, way. It's namely you have to um, you have to calculate. Because in the end there is always one tactic, one way or another way, um, in which you should win. And here there's a very nice final combination. Um, white took rook d1. And again, after rook d1, uh, the rooks will be taken out of the game and upon the game is simply won. We will see later on in our games which we play in the tournament that we have several choices and in general it's much better to keep one pair of rooks on the board. Uh, there are three arguments um, why we want to keep it. One is that two rooks are normally very dangerous uh, for the king. So when you exchange one pair of rooks the king can, can, uh, can become much more active. Second. When you're attacking, the defensive rook is very often undefended, so you can walk with some kind of pin. And third um, is that you very often need your own rook to attack. Uh, in that case, it's also good to keep one pair of rooks on the, on the board. But of course, when we have concrete situation with some concrete exchanges, it's of course allowed to um, exchange the second rook and be ready to play the end of the game. Um, so after rook takes d1, rook takes d1, king c5, g5, and the pawns are promoting uh, because the h pawn, uh, the king is out of si outside the square. Of course, if the king will try to get into the square, then we have another difficulty is that we can still play. Um, well, you can still play g5, but you can also play b4. Um, and again, uh, try to promote on this side because there are two ways. Um, so, when we look back, uh, we see that uh, this is a very nice example on how Kasparov improved his position little by little. Uh, first one pawn, then another pawn, tried to keep his pieces free from defense task. Um, then he was a little bit activating his king, not so much this game because the rook was still cutting off the king from the game. Um, but the other pieces, the rook and the uh, bishop, were cooperating well together uh, and by advancing his pawns he could make the final tactics in which he won the game. Very nice example. Um, so let's go back um, to this position and we will see one of the positions uh, which is actually played uh, by several um, uh, players and let's go first to this end game. It was a game um, played by uh, Mr. Tino12 and Pion Chapter number three, very nice names. Um, and it was one of the 
a playing exercise in which I think is black is a little bit better. Um, the four uh, four two formation gives him a little bit of advantage over uh, the white position, but of course, um, March is still uh, on stake, and um, yeah, it's very, uh, it's very nice to um, see how to progress. Okay, I think that in most of the games rook d8 was played and this is actually a very good um, a move because uh, we want to exchange one pair of rooks but as I announced before we want we prefer to keep the second one on the board and so many uh, many players went for the pawn uh, or the yeah, equal bishop and game or sometimes even pawn and game um, this is interesting, but I don't think this is um, the best way for white, black to play because, um, yeah, he has an easy time to advance his pawns with g5, f5, as we will see later. Uh, and his rook can still be supportive with rook g8 and uh, to play the move g4. Um, and he can try to make use of his bishop on c6, which is already attacking f3 and g2. Um, Okay, we will have several options later. Uh, first, we will look to one of the options, uh, rook g4. Um, I'm not that sure if it's smart for white to play this move. Uh, white tries to pretend a little bit in this way that he's a little better. Um, and uh, But I'm not sure if this is the case. He can try to make maybe some use with h4, h5. And after, of course, he can uh, push his pawns on the queen side. But once more you see that the white rook has little space and actually is only helping the black pawns to advance. So g6 which is played in most of the games is a good move. Um, making progress on the king side and this is, yeah, I think is one of the best moves. Now comes the interesting uh, question because uh, as probably the players who play this position uh, remember, uh, many try to move h5. Um, I don't think it's a bad move, but I also think it's not the best one. Um, h5 is just, um, um, yeah, keeping h4 on its place, but in the end we should remember which, um, um, which pawn we should uh, make progress. I mean, why are we? How are we going to win? The e pawn is actually the only pass pawn we can get, and uh, that's the pawn we should move uh, in the end. So I think that f5 with the idea king f6 e5 is much more appropriate to go for than h5. Um, we have a question about Mr. Borenches. I hope you enjoyed the show. Um, what resources should you study to become a good uh, a so-called technically test chess? Well, uh, very nice question. Um, I think that um, uh, the most important thing to improve your chess is to study uh, uh, games from a little bit the ancient time or the old times, so to say. Uh, the 50s, even Capablanca, you could start uh, he already very well uh, knew how to play end games in a very good technical uh, technical way. Uh, he used his king, he used his pawns, and he used his forces. And actually, when you're studying, you should actually look to those three uh, principles and how they are applied. Um, you see that actually all the games have some kind of model. Um, first, they advance one side of the pawns then they supported by pieces, then they go to the other side, then they supported by pieces. And then they try to work with the two weakness principles so that you work on both sides and in the end you try to win. Um, so when it comes to books, um, I would say that I love the book of Endgame Strategy of Shiroshevsky. It's a little bit uh, older book. Uh, but I still think that is one of the best books uh, written. Um, he made thematic uh, topics uh, in which he showed the games between, let's say, 1900 and 1940. Um, old games, but very classic games, and if you want to make a good foundation, that's a very good start to work on your uh, technique. Once more, there's a big difference between endgame theory and endgame technique. Technique is actually everything before theory. Theory 
Um, there are actually two good books. Uh, one is 100 End Games You Must Know from um, uh, Jesus de la Vila. He described uh, perfectly well uh, some in 100 End Games what you should know about End Games. Um, the other one, which is much more extensive, um, studied is the the work of Duretsky. Um Excellent work, but uh, of course much more difficult. And if you don't want to be a little bit discouraged by the fact that you need to study a lot, then maybe this one hundred end games book uh, would be more your cup of tea. Um, of course. Um, there's one more uh, method, uh, it's the stepping uh, method, uh, which is actually the Dutch method uh, which we use for our youth in Holland. Um, in, those, uh, in those books there are also topics very uh, well explained, um, but this is a little bit more searching uh, through the chapters uh, where you can find them, but uh, the good thing is there's a lot of exercises which will help you to master uh, the theoretical endgames. To come back, uh, technically end games, uh, so to say, is the game of uh, Shirsevsky, end game strategy. If you want to have more recent works, um, I am enjoyed very much reading the book of Lars Bohansen uh, about end game strategy. He gives more recent examples and so if you feel that old games are a little bit too old for you, that might be a little bit more um, yeah, fancy option. Um, and. Um, yeah, I would say that these books are a very good uh, start to make. Um, there's another question by Mr. Uh, Fai. Uh, the question might sound simple. I'm on 2000, 2050 LO uh, rating. My biggest weakness is that I always need uh, more time in every position uh, and I don't want to miss a single detail. How can I improve my calculation visualization skills in an efficient way? Um, Let's come back to that a little bit later because this show is mainly about techniques. Um, once more, um, last time in our show we discussed calculation, um, which uh, in the basic uh, means that you need to improve on uh, motives. After you need to be able to work these motives in a certain way um, so that you can calculate them. Visualization is about board vision. Um, Actually, I would really advise you to work with the step-by-step -step method because this is one of the best methods to learn uh, tactics uh, because it's done very systematically. Um, so I uh, suggest you to have a look at them. Um, okay, let's go back to the game. Um, after F5, I think it's a very good move once more because you can make progress in this position. Um, Rook d6 might be, um, yeah, there's maybe, uh, there's not much difference between king f6 and rook d6. What I like very much about this game so far is that you see that he thinks about how can I improve my pieces, how can I improve my pawns and how can I improve my king. And you see that in every move, actually all the last three moves, he improved one of those um, um, uh, position because the king now uh, supports e5 he can bring the other rook uh, into the game controlling the d-file and you see that black already has a substantial um, advantage um, there's one more question let me see um, uh, in search of perfection nice book when I remember well uh, it was made by Polichieski or it was it was uh, Glickerich, I'm not that sure. Anyway, um, we have a nice training so far. Uh, you mentioned that black is uh, slightly better because of the 4-2-3-3 uh, three, three pawns formation and the remaining pieces on the board, rook plus uh, bishop. Uh, would generalize this also for a position uh, where both are placed uh, by knights? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I think that because the bishop uh, here is very active and he is aiming at uh, f3, g2, which means that it's much easier for black to make an attacking object uh, on the king's side. Uh, he can play h6, g5, g4, 
uh, making a weakness on f3. When we would replace both uh, pieces with knights, um, it's a little bit more tough. I still think that black would be a little bit better uh, because of the fact that he has one central pawn, which means that he can keep his king much more in the center, which uh, in which he can make much more easy progress. Um, but I agree that I would be a little bit um, anxious to, to make a generalization that the position is as good uh, as with bishop, because with bishop it's much more clearer. Um, but still, I think that it's much easier to pro make progress with the pawn, four pawns, especially since the king is already supporting it. Um, yeah, I think so far that would be the answer to your question. Um, um, yeah, Mr. Fai uh, uh, is asking, can you tell me a little bit more about the step, by step method later on? I will come back to that. Um, and if I don't manage it in this show, I will definitely be glad to give an answer in a private message. Um, let's go back to um, Bishop d3. And here you see, I'm, I really enjoy the way how Black is playing the position. He makes slowly progress, no rushing. Um, and yeah, he's... he's enjoying the position. I mean, this that's in fact what you should do. You shouldn't worry too much about if I will be winning or losing. I'm just improving my position. I do it every time by thinking what is my worst piece or what is uh, which element my king, my pawns or pieces needs to have some extra um, support. Um, and once more, uh, just to be sure, um, when it's concerning your game, um, never feel please offended or uh, by my remarks or of course it's nicer to have some compliments. Um, but I try to do it as technically as possible. Um, so see it as an opportunity for yourself to look to which moves are good or not. I can assure you that I play many grandmasters and they were torturing me in this kind of position and I would face the white pieces in such kind of position. I had a tough time. Um, but what I always realize, uh, was try realizing is that when I would play the next game against a weaker opponent, then it would be my turn to have this favorable endgame or I can show that I have my favorite um, favorable way of playing this position. So keep in mind that we're always working on uh, winning as much as possible, which means that of course sometimes we lose, we make some bad moves, that's all in the game. But we still try to yeah, keep up the good work and make some progress. A6. Um, this move is considered um, to be not the best um, by the engines and this will happen much more often. Um, and that uh, the engines show that some moves are technically uh, tactically uh, not always the best. I'm not that much interested all the time in if the engine gives this as the best move or not. I'm very, especially in the beginning when I'm training with my players, it's much more important if they have the right way of thinking, if they have a positive mindset on how to improve the position. Of course, we need to work on details um, in the end because uh, chess is about tactics, uh, yeah, very much about tactics. But still, um, um, I enjoy uh, when I'm studying uh, these kind of games, the way they try to play for a win and they try to, um, yeah, make progress. So, um, of course, it's important to uh, see what, what should have done. Uh, B5 is a better move to restrict the white rook. Sometimes we can play A5 simply trapping the rook and uh, we can already see that this is uh, yeah this is really quite uh, difficult as we will see later on um, tactics are very much important and you should have also and develop also some way of awareness on how you can improve this skill to be aware that there are tactics in the position some weaknesses and you should make use of it g5 so he's continuing the same way. Uh, very. That's also one of the strengths, um, I would say, is that you are uh, consistent with your plan and try to execute in a nice way. But white was ready to fight. And this is, of course, important. We never won any game by resigning. And g4 is one of those uh, moments in the game 
where White was thinking, okay, maybe I didn't make all best moves, but this is, uh, I'm not going to lose without resistance. I made g4, destroying the pawn structure, and now the game is already uh, going up and down. I mean, there's, uh, it will come into some kind of roller coaster where both sides had good chances and had some tactics. Uh, and that's, of course, um, also important. Uh, there will be more time pressure. Um, it's much more difficult to stay calm, to stay focused on what you should do. But we still try to apply the rule that with every move we try to improve our pieces. So rook d8, um, rook f1, which is actually not a very good move because, again, we have some tactics. Does anybody see? What could be done in this kind of, in this position? How black can win? If you know the answer, you can just write it in the chat. Let's see who's first. How black can make use of the position? Until that, we can see. We should search for attacking objects, which means that you. Um, you need to attack something undefended and try to make use. Mr. Ritvik is one of the first one. He is announcing a5. And actually, rook d1 by Mr. Funbeat. Um, so keep in mind that when you make a calculation, we usually need two moves. Exactly. Also, nk h8. <laughs> ah, you see the move in the list. Ah, that's also very nice. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's that's one of the difficulties sometimes. Um, so a5 is a very good move with the idea of bishop e2 intending to um, uh, attacking both rooks and winning the exchange. And there's no time for discover attack because we also attack the, uh, the piece uh, which gives checks. So rook d1 was okay, um, but in this case black could escape. And now again he was exchanging the rooks, rook b6, bishop c6. And again white could make use of the position by attacking the weakest spot, the pawn on b7, gaining, um, uh, atta yeah, attacking the pawn on b7 and actually creating a pass pawn, which gives white a clear, better position. Let's go back. So what did we see? We saw that actually black was trying to uh, play in the way of Kasparov by um, uh, exchanging one pair of rooks. White didn't want to cooperate and went away, but in fact he paid the price of uh, giving a lot of tempi to um, black with um, moving his pawns in the center with f5, rook d6, king f6 and e5 and already black had an, um, um, yeah, big advantage. So let's go back to uh, another one um, and this is actually one of the examples um, about exchanging to the opponent game. Uh, it's a game between Jens 26 12, very nice rating, or maybe it's your birthday, so soon there will be pie with uh, pie and some champagne uh, against Mr. Knutund Knufi, also a very nice name. I'm always uh, imagining how people will think of all those creative names when they're making their accounts. Uh, so once more, um, black exchanged one pair of rooks and this is good, but in this case I would rather prefer to keep the second one still on the board and as we will see uh, advance his pawns on the king side. Later we will come back. But let's uh, go to the pawn and game uh, uh, um, equal uh, bishops uh, first. Uh, because many of you play this kind of end game and they want to know of course uh, how the position is. I think that the position is rather equal but very important is if you play uh, more according to the position you will win easily. 
and this is actually what we saw many uh, positions were won by black or by white simply by applying a better uh, use uh, yeah better principles by making use of his king um, in cooperation with pawns and the bishop king to two both activate their kings well that's very good c4 making progress king d6 King c3. Actually, I'm very happy uh, so far how the position is played um, because uh, both make uh, progress. And now we come to an important uh, moment. Um, white, black played f5, which is not bad, but f somehow it feels like it's not the best either. Um, of course, the white wants at some point wants to make the move f4, so g3, f4 or something. On the other hand, we still should keep in mind that we never want to play on our weaker side because we can't win on that one. It's like making a, you can't make a goal on your own half in football. So um, we want to make progress, and actually, I like to move e5 from general principle. E5 is actually advancing candidate pass pawn first, which is very important rule in pawn and games. Uh, so you move the pawn which um, doesn't have any uh, pawns opposite to it. Um, of course, after B4, you still can play F5, and maybe you can say, well, in the end, it's about the same, but it's about the principle. You can't if you want to play in perfection. So e5 is a little bit more accurate, although I still um, like to move g5 too because it's uh, restricting the white pawns very much. Uh, you have still the opportunity to play g4 at the appropriate moment. Uh, if white is trying to play king v4, we still can gain some time with e5 and then f5, making some progress. Um, so. Again, you see that both sides should want to progress their pawns, and that's what the game is about. Uh, white play g3, in this case, again, I would prefer to play b4. Just, uh, yeah, you should make progress with your own pawns, and you shouldn't play on a refrain, you should refrain from playing on your weaker side. g5, f4. Tricky move. Very tricky, uh, tricky actually, because again, white is playing on his weaker side, which is usually not a very good idea because that means that black will create a pass pawn for himself and you will get into trouble, which actually could have happened in the game. G takes f4, g takes f4, and now again, we uh, shouldn't play on our weaker side, which happened in the game. He played b5, but we should play e5 play on your stronger side, there you will create a pass pawn and with the pass pawn we can make further progress. King d3, most pleasant or easiest way is bishop e4, king e3, f4, king f2, king d4. And maybe the position is not winning yet, but it's already, already a very good position. Um, it's clear that black has a huge advantage, his king is much more active. He can make advance with his pawn to a5, b6, and then try to get with his king to the pawns on the queen side. So actually, uh, here black had a big opportunity to go for uh, uh, these moves. Um, but he played b5, cb5, cb5, king d4, bishop d5. Actually white is much better already here. Um, uh, because now white has a pass pawn and the pawns on e6, f5 are stuck. So uh, uh, later the black resigned. Um, again, what we saw is that uh, we have to make a decision on how we can make progress uh, by playing this position. Um, it's about king, it's about pawns and it's about bishop and how we should uh, yeah, activate it. Keep also in mind that you always need to play on your strongest side, otherwise you can't win. Um, let's go to the position uh, how it was played um, uh, in the example and that was um, this game. Um, it was an analyzed position, uh, rook a d8, rook d1, 
one pair of rooks is exchanged and now we get immediately to g5. g5 is um, actually trying to make space, uh, gaining space, um, playing on the stronger side, uh, already have some idea that in the end we want to play g4, make weakness on f3 or g2 and in this way get a pass pawn to win the game. King d2, activating the king, f5, king e3, h5. You see that uh, black very consistently uh, advances his pawns, really try to make use of his strength and in this way try to, um, yeah, to put pressure on white. The position would still be in, um, in let's say, in equal terms. It's, it's not that black has advantage, but he already put some pressure on white. White should make some decisions and under, uh, yeah, under pressure we always make mistakes. And that's actually what happened in the game. H4, uh, once more he's trying to, um, yeah, gaining space because maybe there will be some weakness on h2 or on g with g3 on g2. Uh, so he has some ideas with g playing g3 and if he take then with rook g8 we can enter a position with rook g2 or on g3 sometimes we can play h3 and if the rook comes around and grab the pawn on h2 the h1 is already prom almost promoted. c4 important move to get some active play yourself uh, although maybe in this position it would be wiser just to play first bishop f1 um, defending all uh, yeah all pawns but still here black could gain space uh, by activating his king with e5 king e6 it's always about activity and creating activity e5 once more the same motive as in the game but at least c4 is not really helping. c5, bishop d5, um, g3 was also an option to play for uh, with black because after g3 you can just take and after taking there's still rook g8 with rook g2 coming. Um, bishop d5, a3, a5, Bishop b6, a4. Again, the same technique we saw with Kasparov. He's uh, locking the pawn on b2, so it can be conquered one day. And on the other end, you still can make progress with your own pawns on the king side. Bishop b5, f4. He sacrifices one pawn for creating a passed pawn. And again, we see another problem that the white king is almost in trouble. So in this case, uh, there's a huge difference between the black king and the white king. The white king is in mate when the rook would enter the back rank and the black king is very active in the center, supporting his own pawns, uh, still in the square of the opponent's square. Uh, so in this, in this case, um, yeah, um, black has a very good position. Rook c8. Okay, making progress and now it's already close to mate. Bishop e4, bishop d3. And just exchanging the position. And white resigned because after king takes f1, I play king d2 and I can just collect a pawn on b2 in a3 and promote my pawns. Very nice game. That was actually one of the ideas how it could have been played. Um, I think that the most important lesson for most of the players who was play who were playing this position is that you keep one pair of rooks on the board. Uh, you try to play in your stronger side, advancing your pawns. Keep your uh, king near to support your pawns, and at some point you need to attack with uh, your pieces to yeah to win material. So that's actually the focus on um, yeah these kind of positions. Um, I think that um, yeah. So when we recall the whole position, and actually we will have a brief look at the other position, but actually the game of Horak is about the same as this position. When you're playing technically chess, uh, you always should keep in mind that you should have a relaxed uh, mode. You should have um, 
you should enjoy the position. Uh, try to advance your pieces in a very slow way. Um, just try to make. Um, to, yeah, you should keep in mind where you want to attack your opponent. Um, uh, use your pawns if your pieces can't attack it well enough uh, by making tension and then to destroy the pawn structure and in this way you just improve it. Um, so I think that is the main point which you should keep in mind. Um, so let's go back to the last position of today. Um, it was the position between Mr. Horak and Mr. Kishilev um, and they played this nice position. Um, many players also in this position uh, they exchange one pair of rooks but in this position it's not really uh, necessary because um, black is always able of exchanging rooks because white can't play rook c1 so we can make use of both by um, advancing already g5 which was in a similar way of how we advanced in the previous position uh, rook d8 Rook d1, and once more you see uh, good technical skills. He played rook g8, not exchanging the rook yet. Uh, like in uh, the game of Fischer against Taimanov, he kept one pair of rooks on the board by only exchanging it maybe later on when um, you already weakened the position so much that um, uh, yeah, that that it doesn't matter. Although in this position and when you analyze with uh, engine you will see that rook d1 is also quite interesting because uh, the pawns on the um, on the king side are already pretty weak. Um, you can play b5 and after exchanging we will see that with bishop f1, bishop g1 coming uh, the pawns are really vulnerable so black would have an advantage in this case too. Uh, still, you see that when you study uh, the yeah the, the 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 strongest players in the world, they rely much more on general rules than some on concrete uh, variation because they trust that over these one hundred years where we de were developing our game, uh, yeah the the method of how we win the risk uh, analyzing they make. Uh, concerning to get this win, uh, it goes in a certain uh, sequel and one of them is that you keep the one pair of rooks just on the board because you never know if um, yeah if it will be enough uh, advantage to win the game because to have some small advantage is not always enough to win the game. Uh, so rook g8 according to theory, h5 advancing attracting g4, a3 and this is one of the things which I was um, amazed by Karpov who always sends this kind of small moves uh, when your opponent was just making um, innocent moves just to make some advances um, he always exploited it in a very good way and we see that Kishilev did it also he played a5 immediately restricting the pawn on um, by advancing to b4 and also you can make use of it by playing a4 um, keeping the pawn on b2 on its place again the technique which we saw also by the game of Kaspar Fukic and this is an excellent move and you can see that the strong uh, technically players are always able to make such moves and to notice that a3 already is in slight um, yeah, in accuracy uh, which gives already uh, black a little bit of better play uh, once more, we don't think in winning or losing in such kind of position. Um, that's not yet the case. It's just about improving uh, the position by itself. Bishop a7, rook c8, bishop d3. White doesn't know what to do, so he's just going with his pieces one way or another. a4. Once more, we are not in a hurry. We just improve position little by little. King c2, g4. Uh, executing the plan how we announced before and even not we don't care about he could take twice because we have rook g8 rook takes g4 and the pawn on g2 is already very vulnerable um, maybe one of the things which is good to explain is uh, still why didn't we play in this kind of position something like f6 
uh, which was uh, several times. I saw that uh, F6 was played with ID E5, which is not so bad, but we can see that after F6 and E5, for example, um, uh, in this position, um, we still need to go. Let's go for this one. Bishop c3, and if we play e5, it's not so bad, but still we feel that after bishop f5, white, white got some kind of defensive resources, uh, which he actually doesn't deserve. Um, he, can he can keep some eye on these white squares, um, and actually it's just a pity just to give him these options. So, uh, when we come back and we see that we keep the pawns in f7 and e6 so we can we are always able to advance them to f6 and e5 to make progress um, but we don't have to play them yet um, bishop e2, bishop takes g2, king c3, b6 once more we uh, keep all pieces uh, under protection we don't want to uh, make bigger risks than necessary and okay we can just make progress still on a stronger side so on the weaker side we keep everything under control on the other side we try to win bishop c6 now we advance f6 now it's time to do so uh, rook h8 also here again of course we can attack the pawn on g4 but we can't make progress so he played rook h8 um, rook d3 rook h2 I think even in this kind of cases it's clear that black might not be winning but we just try to make pressure on the white position uh, and by making pressure of course it's much tougher for white to keep the balance and to keep it within the limits of draw. Uh, we see even that on grandmaster level that only Giri is one of the few players who almost doesn't lose any game but all the other players from time to time they have difficulties to keep a drawing position uh, within its limits. Uh, bishop c5, bc5, rook g3, king d6 advancing the king. So again we see that we have these several options about uh, making progress with pawns, keeping the king active, also our pieces. Um, and sometimes we need to play around. This is a little bit what Botwinnik very often uh, did too is he was just playing around and at some point there was a weakness uh, just by repeating the moves so opponent needs to make a choice f5 rook d8 f4 bishop e4 and white resign what is um to uh, yeah, to round up our session for today, what is the most important thing? What we saw, um, you need to keep in mind that when you make progress, you need to do it in a very smooth way. You need to ha keep uh, yeah to have time um, to make the progress and to yeah to work hard because end game is every time it requires a lot of energy. Um, once I had a training session with Mr. Nikolic, uh, Petrok Nikolic, and he was telling me that he won a very uh, nice Queen End game in a very beautiful way. And actually, he put a lot of effort in it because he was not sure if he was winning or not. But the second time, when he was playing the same end game with some advantage, he was thinking, okay, I won it last time, so it's just kind of routine. I would just improve it and uh, just. Um, um, yeah, I would just win it again. But then the second time he was much more layer and uh, much more relaxed to uh, put the effort into the game and end, game ended in a draw. So uh, always keep in mind that playing end games, you always need to have focus. You always need to have a big desire to win the game because um, yeah, it's not an easy case and there's also not an easy way to get it. Uh, we discussed some technical ways who can support you. Uh, we saw that this advance and to keep the pawns on its place is a very good way. Then always you win on the, your stronger side. Keep that always in mind. I can't tell that enough. Um, and um, yeah, the king of course is in the end game a much more uh, uh, important piece to bring into the battlefield 
because the king uh, can get active because he's not so vulnerable anymore. Keep one pair of rooks on the board because you need the attacking uh, possibilities. You need to try to make weaknesses with the rook and only we exchange the second one um, when we already have a feel that we can't make progress anymore or that we uh, can go into the decisive phase of the game. Um, I hope you enjoyed the show. Um, we will announce uh, the dates, further dates, uh, as soon as possible. Um, and I will try to make some interesting tournaments again. Uh, and I hope uh, yeah, to see you next time again. Thank you very much and see you next time.